Hello everyone, welcome back again. My name is Jesse, and in today's tutorial, we're going to have a function in Julia. So, what is a function? So, a function is a first class object that takes a tuple of argument and then returns a value, right? So, in Julia, to create a function, the basic sentence of creating a function in Julia is to go with the keyword function, right? Then, function, then the name of the function, and then your argument. So, let's give it an argument of, let's say, x, right? Okay, perfect. So, you don't need to bring a column here, you just reset away with this, and then you give you do your calculation, so let's add plus 10 to it, then end. So by default, it's going to use the last value, the last expression as the return value. It's going to use it as a return value. So if I want to declare this particular function that I have here, I want to declare this function, I can just go straight away with f. Then I supply my value of let's say 10, then do it to me as 20, right? So by default, we return this particular value. So this is the first method of creating a function in Julia. So the second method of creating a function is just to go with the normal simple simple way of g the function above can be written as this let's give it as function let's give it a bit different value g right and i supply my argument of a plus b a b that is a function that takes two arguments then a plus b right so if i go straight away with this is also another way of creating a function so i can supply this particular stuff a plus b with two and then Right, so it's give me seven. So this is the second method of creating a function. So either you go straight away by fully declaring function, or you can just go straight away with this to declare a function, to define and declare function. Okay, perfect. Now let's see another way of working with function when it comes to the return value. So you realize that here we don't need to declare any return, but it return by default the last expression. The same way you can actually be specific and declare the word return. So let's be specific on what to retain. So I can create a simple function. So let's use the same function here. And then right, I have two first expression and then the second expression. So it's going to be instead of b plus will be by 10. Will be by 10. So by default, it's going to retain this particular last function. So if I check for f of this, this place 10 there, it's going to give us. The last value which is 100 instead of giving us as 20 right but if i want to be specific i can bring the return here then it's going to return this one but not the last expression so if i run this particular function again it will give us as 20. so that is the point to use the return and that's the essence of the return to be more specific on what to return and what not to return okay. so that is the something about the return value now let's check some interesting things you can do so you can also assign a function to a particular value so let's say I have value of h, can I assign this function that I have as f, as f here. Now with this as new assignment, I can actually do h to bracket 30 and it's going to work perfectly for us as 40. So this is something you can also do in Julia. So to be more explicit with your function creation, you can also be more explicit by going with this particular format. So function, let's go as function area, right? And then I'm going to be more explicit with the value I'm supplying. So S, then I can be more explicit by defining the particular time point. Yes. So if I go with int 64, it's going to be specific. My, my system is 64 as well. Then if I go with a 10, 10x by let's say 2, right? Then end. So this is a more explicit function declaration of function, and it's going to be, make it more faster. Right, but it's very very strict so if i go with area i supply a value of let's say 12 it's going to give me a value of 24 but if i supply an area of a floating point number 12.0 it's going to give me an error method error because it is strict it only accepts integers so i can to make it more specific that is when i go with this particular stuff but in case i don't want to be strict i can just go straight away and declare it without the type definition right so that one is that, that key is going to be something like this then I, i'll just leave it straight away without any stuff so by this it's going to be let's make it as two so it's going to be it's not going to be specific so it's an accept any number so area two of let's say 12.0 is going to work right if i do area two The two of let's say 12 is also going to work so to accept both floating or integers 
So that is another way. There's also another way of working with it, of including multiple dispatch into this particular stack. By default, if you go with this, you're going to use multiple dispatch to work with it. But you can also be specific and create your own multiple dispatch format by going with this. Let's create another one. Let's call it as same area, right? So this is going to be for integer, and then I can also be more specific and create the same function but be specific of float, then 64. So that this function is going to accept either it's a float or an integer. So if I check for the method here, yeah, it's going to it's going to list it for me as two methods, right? So area has two methods, it's having an integer and a float. So this is one of the ways of creating an instant format of a multiple dispatch. So it's now going to accept this particular method as well as this particular method because it's that is one nice thing about doing okay. Now let's work on argument, right? So how do we work with multiple arguments and then several arguments, default arguments, variable number of arguments and keyword arguments? So let's create a simple function of function, then triangle, triangle, I don't know how to spell triangle. So this is going to take a default, a standard argument of B for the base, then a default argument of H, right? It's an optional argument. And I'm going to make it, keep it as for the height as mean of 10. Then I'm going to return the summation of it, which is going to be 1 divided by 2 by base times height, right? So something like this. So something simple. So if I run this particular function, now it's going to work on the standard arguments, right? The one I'm supplying, and then this is going to be an optional argument. So if I Go through the way and create something like angle triangle. Then I supply, let's say, 2012, right? By default, it's going to work and give me 60 without supplying this H. That is the default or optional argument. But I can be specific and then change this particular stuff here by going with triangle, then giving it as 12, and then I'll supply the next argument of instead of. Then I'm making it as 100 so that's to see 600. So that is another way of working with it in trivia. So this is a default argument, right? This is a standard argument and this is the default argument. So now let's see how to work with keyword arguments in trivia. So to work with keyword arguments in trivia, let's see something. So I have this particular function which is a for loop and it's having length, width, and height. So these are in a specific order. So in case I'm supplying any arguments, I must follow this order. So let's run this particular function that we have and then if I give it as example so let's see my value volume right then the lines let's say the width let's give it an example so let's say my width I want I want my width here to be 30 right so the first time I run this function I run it as my length of 20 my length of my width of 30 and then my height of 10 right if I run this function it's going to run perfectly for me so my length was 20, 30, and 10. But in case I make the point and then I change it to volume, then instead of making it as 20, I, I change this 20, this 30, and put it at the last end. Right? So, so 10 and 30. So this is going to print a different result. So this is good, but it's giving me not what I want. So that is a concept and a reason why keyword argument is more useful. So it allows us to be able to deal with this ordering stuff, right? This is ordered, so it must follow this particular order. So with the keyword argument, you don't need to follow the order. With the keyword argument, all you need is you are using the keyword, right? That's why it's a keyword argument. So how do we work with that? So it's going to be something like this. Let me copy this particular function that I have here. And to create a simple keyword argument from this, let's go with this. Then I'll bring a semicolon here, right? So this is going to be my length, and I'm going to supply the value, or I can go without the value, then my width. So this is going to be, let's say, 30, because that's what we're using, and my height is going to be, let's say, 20. Perfect. So with this particular format that I have now, right, perfect. So this is a new function I've created. So let's call the function 
function 2 by calling 2 to fit. So with this particular function that I've created, now it's going to be more explicit. So if I go with volume 2, now I can be more specific because of this semicolon. Now if I want to declare it, I have to just go with length. Then I'm, I can say length. Then 30, 30. So if I run this particular function, it's going to return our values here without any issue. So it doesn't matter the location. So if I can bring this one, it doesn't matter the location now. All it depends on is the value, is a keyword. So I can put this one in any location. Can you put it at the back here? And it's still going to work perfectly for us. So that is returning it perfectly well. So that is the concept about keyword argument in Julia. So it's very, very useful and very, very powerful. So you can also work without creating, without putting a value, not necessarily putting a value. So let's see that one. Let's call it volume three. Without putting this value here, and then it's still going to work because of the command that you have put. Because of the semicolon that you have put. So if I run this volume three, and then I run this particular stuff here. Okay. You can see that it's still working, right? So we're not necessarily bringing the volume here, but it's still going to work in this particular stuff in a nice way. Okay, so that is something about keyword argument in Julia. And let's see some other stuff you can also do with the bar axe, right? With the bar axe. Okay, perfect. So how do you repeat the bar axe? So the bar is quite simple, just go with function. Then let's give it as something simple. Let's say by me, right? So I'm just talking by me. So the variable number of arguments goes with this sentence of defining the argument. So arg, so it can be any value. So let's say arg, right? Any value. Then you bring the splat operator. So triple slot, right? This is called a splat operator or an ellipsis. So we're going to accept any number of values I bring. So I can just create something like print line. Then it's going to print the number of my values, so number of arguments. Then I'm going to give it a simple start to check the number of arguments. So let's use what you have learned previously. So the length of this whatever will be supplied, right? Of this our argument. So that is what we have done, something simple. And I can just do for arguments in arguments, right? We have not learned about it, but we'll learn about it later. Print line app. So that's going to supply and bring end for the for loop and then end for the simple loop. So this is a simple function you have created, which is a by me method. If I run this particular stuff here, let's play of this and then let's run it as by buy me so buy me what do i want to buy i want to buy banana if i run this particular function it's going to work perfectly for us so orange banana so the number of arguments is three so this is a variable number of arguments by bringing this particular supply operator so i can supply thousands of thousands of arguments and then it's still going to work perfectly so even if i repeat this one here It's still going to work perfectly and then work giving us all of this. So the number of arguments was six. This way. So that is the concept about the variable number of arguments by bringing this plot of data. Okay, so thank you for watching this tutorial. One of the nice things about this particular study we have done so far is that Julia's function allows us to do some very powerful stuff with the dot synthesis, right? The vectorization. So let's say we had a function called this. Let's give it a simple function. Let's create a simple function of let's say f. Let's make it fx, right? function fx and you're creating a simple function that takes a value of a and then it's do something it does something with this it's going to raise it to the power to right so that is the function you have created a simple function like fx so now if in case i have an array now i want to apply this particular function to this so with this particular function of this we can be able to do that in a simple way by applying it as fx dot right so the fx dot is going to take this particular function and apply it to all of this particular set of that. So fx dot then into bracket my array. So which is very so this is going to be the argument equated to this particular stuff. So we're going to apply this particular fx function that we have done to all of them, which is very, very nice and very powerful.
the children that have done it go through 4, 4, 16, and 10. So that is the power of Julia's fraction with the dot sentence. So this particular dot sentence has been applied to all of them in a very nice way, so making it more powerful and more intuitive. Every function quiz can just use this particular stuff to work on it. So even in this particular stuff that I have here, even in something like area, right? This area that we had it. So I can also apply this particular stuff on this. So area dot then multiply my value that I have. So let's say I have the same array that I have here. Then it's going to work in a nice perfect format for me, which is very, very interesting. Nice. Okay, so thank you for watching this tutorial. If you have any question or contribution, I guess put inside the comment section straight by the number of it. And please don't forget to subscribe and then check the links below for more stuff. Thank you, Steve.